Welcome back to the Aviation RC New Podcast. You found us. My name is Joe. And I'm Matt. We're here to be with you along your journey and to share our experiences in RC Aviation. If you have any questions, thoughts, or want to share a flight story, hit us up at aviationrcnoob at gmail.com. Now, buckle in. Let's take off. Welcome back. We're at episode 17, uh, FAA. Matthew, what were you going for with this title? Fa la 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 la, the FAA. You know, because <laughs> uh, over the holiday season, the FAA made a big announcement. So I yeah. figured that'd be fitting. Yeah, this came out, uh, what, just a couple days after our last episode. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting because we, I think we had touched a little bit on the FAA or at least, uh, well, there was we, a, we, there was a release like a couple weekend a weeks before kind of in conjunction with a leaked DJI document or something like that. Right. That basically said, Oh, don't worry. Uh, you don't have to worry as long as it's under 300 feet, you, you'll all be fine. Why are you worried? Right. <clears throat> and I knew so we everybody about it. You know, at the time, everybody's like, wait, those are the rules? That's simple? 300 feet, you're all good? Just don't worry? Hallelujah, that's simple. Mm-hmm. I, you know, some people were like, no, that, that excludes my soaring. I, I go way over 300 feet some days. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, anyway, I'm glad so, that we reserved uh, statements of we don't know this, the actual rules yet because, no. lo and behold, a couple of days later, um, <laughs> they we were got the nice Christmas simple. gift. <laughs> Yeah. FAA happens. gave us a nice Christmas gift. Sure um, did. so we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about that a bit today. Um, but, uh, before we get into all that, Matthew, and before we talk about flight stories, um, I got you a Christmas gift. What do you mean you got me a Christmas gift? Well, I got you a Christmas so, gift. Well, you did. And I guess my Christmas gift to you isn't quite as nice as what you got for me, but it's differently um, nice. <laughs> So I went ahead and um, set us up with our own email addresses with the Aviation RC Noob. So nice. uh, now we we still have the Aviation RC Noob at gmail.com. But if you guys want to reach out to us individually, uh, you can reach us at either Joe at AviationRCNoob.com or Matthew at AviationRCNoob.com. And that's M-A-T-T-H-E-W. Um, so, is that correct? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, so, Merry Christmas, Matthew. Thank you. Now we're official. <laughs> I mean, really official. Yeah. We were official, but now we're really official. <clears throat> yeah. Next thing we need is swag. Uh, we'll, we'll work on that at some point, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, no, um, thank you. Thank you, Joe, very much. That's awesome. And thank you. Uh, we can, I guess we will talk about it here. At a, well, we can go ahead and say it now, I suppose. Um, yeah. You go got ahead. me a uh Cy- quantum cyclops fpv goggles with a camera to go with it um mm-hmm. so thank you for that as i understand you found a heck of a deal on that one yeah so they are from hobby king and they have a dvr in them they have diversity antennas uh, they come with a patch and a circular polarized antenna which means they are good to go like as a whole what and other box goggles and they're kind of big and they're a little, I'll call it forward heavy, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I think when you put the battery in the back, they generally kind of balance. They do a pretty good job with them. And again, for being, um, I'll call it economy class goggles, they're spectacular. Um, and they have been out. I mean, no stock ever. It's always like out of stock. We'll, we'll let you know. They never let me know, right? I, <laughs> while we were doing the research of the FA, uh, the FBV episode last time, I happen to be, just as we closed it out, I was like, I wonder what the if, let me just check out something. And I was thinking, like, I should get some goggles for Quinn or, or Logan, one of my kids, so that way we'll have three goggles between us. So when they get proficient and we're all flying Spitfires and, you know, Mustangs or God knows what, <clears throat> we'll all be able to do FP. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so while I was there, I was like, they have them in stock. They have these these goggles in stock and on sale, like crazy big sale, like over 50% off kind of sale. And I mm-hmm. thought, oh, 
awesome. I'm putting one in. I put one in the cart immediately, and I'm like, you know, I scratched my chin and thought about you, John. I'm like, yeah, I'm putting in two <laughs> at this price. I might even get a three just because. Um, and I'm like, no, 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 that's that's getting too crazy. So let me leave, put in leave some for the next guy. Yeah, leave some for the next day, exactly. So I put in two, and I put in, the, and I'm like, these are probably go like in seconds. So let me place the order now. Put in the order, and it said like oh, it'll be here between like two uh, and three weeks because it wasn't coming from a USAA factory, or USA, uh, a USA <laughs> factory. Oh my god, that's my insurance company. Thank you. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, same here. It's a wonderful thing, but um, it wasn't coming from the USA. Uh, factory is coming from the china factory at least according to what hobby king said well apparently that wasn't the case they it must have come from a hidden corner of the usa factory that they have a usa warehouse because these things got there within two days they got there faster than most of the amazon products i bought the day before <laughs> was Which, the box smoking on your front porch <laughs> i think it was <laughs> <laughs> anyway so i was like oh shoot uh, and i was fully expecting that they would come in uh, in a couple weeks from now, and that would be our anniversary episode, right? Mm -hmm. And that'd be a perfect time to say, Joe, here you go. Happy anniversary. Welcome. You know, you've been in the hobby for just over a year. We've been doing this podcast for a year. You know, here's a little token of my appreciation for you sticking with this nonsense with me <laughs> for the year. I know it's, mm -hmm. it's you know, it's been interesting. Um, and I, for me, it's been fun. And I think you've enjoyed yourself from what I can tell. But oh, anyway, yeah. that's that's what this is going to be. Plus, I, those cameras are TX06s. They're the super tiny, itty bitty. I think they're 15 millimeters at best. Yeah, uh, they're square. small. They're tiny. And um, I got those. I found those at a crazy good deal. So it was like a Black Friday sale. And I ordered a bunch because I was looking to uh, – I have SkyZone goggles, and they have a 3D setting. And I was thinking, well, if one camera is on one channel on a band and the other camera is on the next band, same channel, those goggles will, they're still just transmitting stuff. So the goggles should receive both signals and I should have 3D, like another set of 3D viewing goggles. And they're small, they'll fit anywhere, lightweight, easy to power, et cetera. So I was like, well, let me get a bunch of those because they're, they're cheap. And so I had, I ordered a couple extra in case I you know, did something stupid and busted one. And then I realized, mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, that's a really good price. Like, that's a no brainer. That's <laughs> this. And, th and that way you have the set uh, that you can start doing FPV once, you know, again, you build another Spitfire. It flies like you expect, like we both are so happy with. And then you can Care take that Careful thing. now, spoilers. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, both of ours are beat up, okay? Fact is, <laughs> if I'm surprised every time that mine still flies at all. And right. I know that you have felt the same way every time you fly. <laughs> You're like, holy cow. So How's I knew it's I knew still it, in the air. At some point, uh, we're going to fly it. Uh, and, and you had said last episode that one of the things you truly love about flying planes is being up in the cockpit. And I'm like, well, you can be. You don't have to be on the ground with uh rc airplanes you can be in the cockpit with fpv mm -hmm. so i thought it would just be something that would help you enjoy the hobby even more yeah and and i've appreciated it and enjoyed it the little bit that i've been able to use it so far um <laughs> which i'm looking forward <laughs> to talking about because that was fun <laughs> um so but before we get into flight stories well, thank you um mm -hmm. i have enjoyed it and I'm looking forward to enjoying it more. Um, let's. Um, you want to go through listener comments? Yeah, because I want to piggyback off of that. There was um, uh, Tench in our Discord server, since we're piggybacking off the FPV, and we were talking about FPV last time. Um, uh, one of our Discord members, Tench, asked us in the uh, in our show notes area, uh, said, I just finished listening through episode 16. Notice there was no mention of an amateur radio license uh, for any FPV gear that isn't labeled as FCC Part 15 compliant. And I said, interesting. Uh, let me do some looking on that. And Matthew, I think you have a better understanding of what, what's going on there. But essentially, uh, the, we need to keep our radio emissions and our interference and all down to a minimal and that's what part 15 is trying to mm -hmm. make sure happens 
Uh, no, he's absolutely right. It was something that had kind of slipped my mind. Um, yeah, if it is not FCC Part 15 certified, you need a ham radio license. Basically, you need to know what you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. And if it is, it it removes that obligation of needing a ham license up to a certain power output. And I think that limit is around like 250 milliwatts. You don't take my word for it. Look it up yourself. But I think if it's under 250 milliwatts, which a lot of all-in-one cameras and stuff will be 200 milliwatts or less, um, if they're FCC Part 15 certified, you are free to just use and, and enjoy. If it's more than that, you uh, may need a ham radio license anyway. Um, because mm -hmm. you, you really need to understand what you're doing when you're putting out that kind of power. One watt of transmission power is pretty powerful. It will go along the order of like 20 kilometers. Ooh. Yeah. So, I mean, it's no joke. 200, 200 is enough for the field. <laughs> yeah. And so knowing that now, um, and I did look at the look at the camera that you got me, and it looks like I didn't see any FCC Part 15 certification on it. So it looks like technically... Mm -hmm. I need to have a ham license um, or amateur radio license to yep. be operating that. So it, it looks like I might need that too. So I guess that'll be another journey, right? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Tench, uh, for pointing yeah. that out to thank us. Thank you, Tench. Looks like we get to get licensed and certified. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and, and that's, look, it's important. It's important to know. And as a beginner, I mean, how in the world are you ever going to find out unless you're savvy enough to look up the FCC regulations and go through their rule process stuff. Same with like when we're looking through the FAA stuff, doing the research, like finding these rules specifically are a bear. So unless you're mm -hmm. used to going to government websites and digging through, I'll call it the archives, you know, to find the thing you need, it isn't easy. Um, so as a noob, like just know it's a thing. Um, be aware when you buy products, look to see that it's, you know, FCC part 15 certified and you are good to go to fly it, uh, especially if it's under 250 milliwatts for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure where the limit is. It might be a little higher, but if you're under that, I, I'm certain you're okay. All right. So we get to get certified. All right. Um, uh, we and I'm, I'm, we're going to post a link. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're going to post a link uh, to um, a website that you basically it is the amateur radio licensing uh, website. It's a r l a r r l dot org, um, and they basically have practice tests. And their goal is to get you ham radio license certified, and and on up. You know, you can you can continue to go higher. Um, mm -hmm. and there's a local club somewhere near you. They're pretty self-governed and you know, you're going to meet a lot of really interesting folk doing that. I've already reached out to a bunch of them for, um, some scout stuff. And so go there, take a look, see what you might need and see if it's something worth your while. If you want long range, if you have the, a, uh, if you have ham radio license certified, you can, um, you can really use, you can get there. If okay. you comply with the other regulations we're about to talk with, talk about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, one other question, and then we'll mm -hmm. get into the flying. Um, Rick Maddox wrote in on our contact us uh, form on the website. Thank you, Rick. Yep. And said, um, are referencing last episode, you were talking about flying the Tiger Cat. He said, are you talking about a profile uh, foam board Tiger Cat in the latest episode? If so, where are you getting the plans from? Great podcast. Thanks. Well, mm -hmm. thank you, Rick. Yeah, thank you, Rick. And Matthew, was that that wasn't a profile, I don't think, was it? Uh no, it's it's not a profile. It's something that one of our uh uh he's a flight test forum member that I've you know, he's a young kid who just really kills it every time he does it. Uh and he's also in our Discord forum. He's called the Hanger. And his name is also Sam, so it's kind of tough. We have the Hanger RC, who is also Sam, um, and then mm -hmm. we have the Hanger. So the Hanger, uh, he just put together pretty, I'll call it traditional flight test style plans for the F7F Tiger Cat. It's, you know, the three-sided uh, engine pod with, you know, a box fuse 
and a fold over wing. And it, and it flies great. It's a lot of fun. So I don't think he's posted the plans yet, but keep an eye out on the flight test forums for it. I'm certain he's done that. Um, he ended up giving me a sneak peek to do a beta build just to see that everything fit. So uh, look in the research resource section of the flight test forums. I'm sure he'll get it together soon. He's pretty much has it done. So I think he's looking to tidy up a piece here or there. And that's assuming he was planning on releasing that, uh, that build out. Uh, right. Uh, unless, you know, somebody approached him and saying, Hey, yeah, I'd like to produce that as a kit. Uh, I haven't heard. So, uh, just keep an eyeball out. And, you know, if you want join our discord, speaking of that, uh, we'll have a link in the, in this show notes here, uh, join our discord and get online and chat with us as you build, or just say, Hey, if you got a question about an episode, we're, all there to help each other out. So, uh, and you'll likely see the hanger in there. He's oftentimes lurking about, just um, you know, letting us know what he's into. So, well, then piggybacking one more time off something, and then <laughs> before we get into everything else, <laughs> uh, we do have a build night. Speaking of a Discord, we do have a build night coming up January fifteenth, uh, eight p.m. to eleven p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Eastern Standard Time. Um, Matthew and I'll be in there and not sure yet what we're building. I might pull out the Corsair, uh, mm -hmm. speed kit and work on that, but, um, come join us. And like Matthew said, discord link will be in the description, bring whatever you're working on or just come and hang with us. Yep. We'll be talking RC for sure. All right. Flying stories, Matthew, what you got? I got nothing. I'm just kidding. I don't have nothing. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but honestly, over the last week, I really haven't done much. Uh, most of what I did was about the week before. Um, I put a motor in the toucan. Mm -hmm. um, and I couldn't fly it, as yeah. you and I found out. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Because <laughs> Joe and I managed to get together over the holidays and just you know, get out and fly. Um, I got out to get out and fly. Well, we were supposed to both get out and fly, <laughs> but um, I, I guess my ESC, I had accidentally reset that the high and the low were both zero output. So oh. it wasn't turning the motor. I'm like, everything else is working. <laughs> I don't get this. Oh, what's going on? And I'm not like, and at that point we're watching the light start to dim. And I'm like, you know, let's just get you in the air and enjoy that. And if I can come back to this cool, if not, that's okay. I'll get to it. Mm -hmm. And it's literally the second I got home, I'm like, I wonder if it's this. So I reset the range on the ESC and sure enough, off it went, you know, there and I'm like, goes. Oh, <laughs> all right. So I'll, I'll fly that again. Um, in a little bit. So it's ready to go. It's hanging up in the ready to go section of the kitchen. Um, I have a couple hooks that are for plants. And so now instead of hanging plants, I hang airplanes. Um, and I brought out the Viking with the intent to 3d print some hinges and get the back, uh, get the landing gear installed. Um, that has sat there on the ends of the table and looking at me every time I sit down, which is nearly every day. Um, but the exciting part is I have put together over the holiday the um, Edwards RC time save, which uh, I got probably one of the one of the few kits he produced. I think he put it online. Uh, he got a ton of orders, and he, I don't think he realized how much effort it would be to get it out to everybody and so i mean it's still all open resource you can still download the entire list there are links for every single product um he just happened to package it up in a box and send it and all he had to do was buy the aluminum rails so that made it mm -hmm. super simple and you print the other parts well i finally got my 3d printer it's been working for a long while so i was able to print out all those pieces um and the rails were already here and his pieces were already here so i said you know what I think it's time to sit down and get that going. So I built it. Uh, I've tested it. I've got it running. I've tested it on the carpet with no foam. And just as I was about to test it earlier today, so I was basically going to do a dry run, or not a dry run, a, a real run of the first cut um, of real foam board. And uh, it looked like one of the steppers was backward or something. Um, I was moving in a way I didn't expect. And just as he was we are doing that. My son tripped over the one arm and broke the 3d printed piece. So, Oh, nice. Anyway, so that will, you'll hear more about it next time. Um, it, a little disappointing, but it's actually as you know, I think the print, the part is already printed and replacing it will take all of about 10 minutes tonight. So I might okay. be doing my initial test tonight. 
Um, let's see. And I think uh, I flew the Spit and the F3F Tiger Cat. I had repaired it and I brought it out to the field. Um, and I was testing the quantum goggles that I received. Um, when I received it, I wanted to check it out and see. And I did a small comparison video. We'll have a link below. Because um, I have a Sky Zone, which is um, kind of in the realm of fat sharks. And so I wanted to see how the video signal compared and how the images looked and all that stuff. So I did a comparison video. I'll tell you what. Um, there's a little bit of vertical hold issue going on, which I was surprised at. And I think it's only in the recording because when you look at it through the goggles, everything looks fine, but the recording has like a, a green bar of some sort of malcontent image. Um, hmm. Anyway, so I was flying the F3, F Tiger Cat around, everything was going okay. And then I think one of the motors gummed up for some reason. And all of a sudden I started doing things I didn't, want and one of the guys it feels like that doesn't look like it's supposed to i'm like yeah tell me about <laughs> it <laughs> but i was able to bring it down to the ground and yeah i think a little bit um abruptly but no real damage um i think i busted a prop maybe so i pulled the motor off and i said well i'll just use one of these motors and i put that one on the t on the spitfire and of course the spitfire went around a couple laps and then it kind of did the same thing again because it was mm -hmm. the motor that was coming up little did i know um, so the Spitfire went down, um, and I think that went down a little bit hard, a little harder, but it's not, um, it's still soft enough where I can fly it again. Um, and I think that was pretty much it. Those are the kinds of things I did around the holiday and the last week. It's just been, uh, busy and lazy, kind of a combination of both. It's hard to, like when I get my free time, it's lazy time on the couch and I, you know, I've got a very comfortable couch. It seems to take me every time. So, <laughs> um, other than that, that, I think that's it. Uh, what about you, Joe? I know uh, we got together and had a little bit of fun. Why don't you talk about what, what you did when we were together and then go from there? Yeah. So you, you managed to come down. Uh, I think it was this la last week. Yeah. It was mm -hmm. anyway, you came down and, we got to spend some time together um, and then do do some flying. Uh, I was spending sort of the the good part of that day, that afternoon, after I got off work, uh, trying to repair the last damage on the Spitfire from when uh, last time I talked about it, I, I crashed it, trying to do the low flies. Mm -hmm. And it just really boogered up the nose section of this plane um the Can lot I of the take Go one ahead. second to acknowledge the giant hole in the side of the spitfire <laughs> <laughs> so he did you, his you last did. repair and and i guess he just said ah, this really isn't that important and there's like from the front of the wing to about uh half of the way up the cowl maybe was mm -hmm. like a section just missing. missing just gone and we're talking it's you know like three inches by an inch and a half or something. It's a significant chunk. Now, <laughs> the truth is, it apparently didn't matter because it flew really It well. didn't matter. <laughs> oh, which I think is awesome. Um, I was just surprised at how sturdy it was without that section. I would imagine mm -hmm. that would give it some serious strength, but apparently uh, that wasn't where the strength is. Uh, not so much. And I'm not going to say she was as strong as uh, the day she was initially built, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that that section in if I, I might have linked pictures in it before. If not, I'll I'll try to make sure I have some pictures in the show notes here so you can you know so you guys can look and see mm -hmm. uh, that that chunk that was missing. I didn't think a whole lot of it other than it was a piece that was torn loose. And yeah, I could have tried to put it back in and glue it. It's like it, time versus benefit. I'm not going to worry about it. So yeah, there's this <laughs> chunk. Uh, missing that I guess you didn't realize was missing until no, you were sitting I, at my dining room table. So I realized it was gone. Like I saw it, but I didn't realize how big it was. I mean, <laughs> it's a significant chunk of the lower front section of the plane. So mm -hmm. uh, again, it's just a three-sided view. So it's not like, you know, for the most part, it's not like it really makes a difference in how it flies, but I don't, I don't know. I was just, I was impressed. <laughs> Uh, and delighted so, that it continued to fly well. So, 
Yeah. And we took it out later that night. Um, and it, it flew, but mm -hmm. I had to basically go in the, the top part of the fuse under the card, the paper, uh, card, card stock, stock mm -hmm. or poster board that was covering serves as sort of the, the rounded top of the plane. I had to take that <laughs> off and get yeah. in there. Cause the, the top flap of the fuselage, uh, had come completely unglued. That's what the motor mm -hmm. kind of hangs on. Yeah. So I had to go in and, you know, put some hot glue and get all that glued back in. And that actually cut a, cause it was, there was a, some foam missing from all that. Uh, and it just was always going to be so strong. So I went in and cut yeah. uh, a rectangular piece that fit on top of that whole section, which yeah. then was covered by the, the poster board. Uh, but I, I cut that to size and glued it in and then trimmed off excess. So then when I put the, uh, poster board back over it, you yeah, didn't you really notice that it, it no. was there. Yeah. You know, no. And, and that, that was able to get the motor in there and all. That structural repair is called a sister sistering. Sistering. So, yeah. When you put a strong beam next to a beam that's not as, you know, that's weakened or damaged, you're, you're basically lending the, strength of the old one to the new one you're putting up you know i hadn't heard it called that but now and i wouldn't have even thought of it as that method but i do remember as a kid and just getting a little off topic but we <laughs> we had um some weakening of floor joists in the house that i grew up in mm -hmm. and i remember going under the house and jacking up jack, basically jacking the house up a bit but that section and then uh bolting in or nailing in, but probably bolting. It's been years and years at this point. But we put mm -hmm. in um, beam side by side of that and sandwiched mm -hmm. it, and then yep. we were able to you know let the jack back down, let it sit on. We we had to build up a, uh, a center block pylon to sit under there to then yep. help hold that. But yeah, mm -hmm. same concept. You're right. Um, and then when that was finished, I very quickly because that was the day you gave me the FPV camera and goggles. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I really wanted to try them out. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I very quickly did up a, um, uh, a camera mount, which really was just, I took a, a chunk of foam, squared it out, uh, and then started cutting out a, a curve out of the bottom of it so that it could sit on the canopy mm -hmm. of the Spitfire. And then when I got that kind of the curve cut right where I could, yeah, I shaved it down so it was more in a, a, a believable size, uh, and then hot glued that, then punched a hole through it for the camera to push through, and then cut a second piece to glue on the back of that, but then I had to cut the, I stuck the camera in through its hole and kind of traced out the square that I needed to cut out so the camera could push the the circuitry that you know kind of backs the camera could push through that so now there's two layer deep you know one with a square cut out that the electronics mm -hmm. kind of push into and then there was a hole cut through the front one that the camera pushed through and a little slot up top so the antenna just kind of boop stuck right yep. up and then put uh drilled drilled quote unquote cut a hole through the top of the fuselage uh sorry the top of the canopy because the canopy was a remo mm -hmm. hole removal section excuse me um cut a hole through the top of that and then through the bottom of the cockpit area so that I could feed the power wire down to the receiver. Mm -hmm. um, Cause that's, for a, a, that's a great part of a fairly about quick job. Ones. Yeah, it Go was ahead. a pretty quick job and you did a great job with it. I was going to say that the power, um, that's a great part about the all in ones is all it really needs is five volt, uh, three and a uh, 3.3 volt to five volt power. So mm -hmm. that's easy to just, if you have a spare channel in your receiver, just, it doesn't run uh, much current. So uh, you just kind of run it down with an adapter and plug it right into your receiver. Yeah. And then it, it worked. We tested it kind of there in the kitchen. It was like, all right, let's go. Um, <laughs> Off we go. <laughs> and like, we were so pressed for time because we were already going to be right up against silhouette flying. And we had like a 20, about a 20 minute drive out to school. So once we got on the road, we diverted and went to a closer location um, that we hadn't flown at for a little while, but it was a park uh, fairly near my place. But originally I was going to have a swing by say Walmart or something, run in and grab a micro SD card. Cause I didn't have one at quick access. And I happened to check one of my drawers, found an old cell phone, pulled the micro SD card out of it and said, all right, we're good. 
and <laughs> turns out you had an extra one or something that mm-hmm. you'd have let me use or something. But oh, yeah, absolutely. we got out there and there was some uh, overlapping of the FPV signals as we were trying to get the planes <laughs> ready to fly. Yeah, um, because when, when but, I plugged in, uh, when I was testing out the Toucan Sam that I brought, you know, when I plug it in, it's linked into, you know, say it starts up the camera and starts transmitting on whatever the default station is, which is the same mm-hmm. default because it's the same camera as you. <laughs> so all of a sudden I'm like, okay, we're good. And I take it out of the car and I'm like, why am I seeing a Spitfire? I put it back in the car. <laughs> okay, it's my signal. Take it out of the car. Why am I seeing a Spitfire? Like, oh yeah, duh. All right, we're on the same channel. <laughs> Hold on, let me, let me switch something. So that was that was easy and, to uh, fix. Yeah, and I hate that you didn't get to get your goblin up in the air, oh, but wow. it ended up kind of working out because I was trying to figure out my goggles and didn't read the instruction manual no, it, before we went. So right, I'm glad we did too. I'm glad that uh, I could be there. So what we ended up doing is you flew line of sight like you normally would. Now it was gray overcast and the sight, the, the light was dimming quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had the FPV. So I was just looking at the FPV feed. We had it recording. And so we were just, you know, looking and I noticed that the camera does a lot better job at picking up the available light than our eyes do. And I was like, Oh no, this mm-hmm. is like, this is daylight, man. We're good. We can fly for at least another hour. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, I can't see a thing. I'm starting to lose it. I'm like, that's cool. Well, what so the point at which I lost it, and, and it was a struggle. Yeah, once we put it down, it was like, all right, let's, yeah, let's pack it up and go <laughs> on home because it's too dark. Um, yeah, and that's poor decision maybe on that front. Um, I'm not wanting to fly when it's that dark again. Yeah, but same. I had eyes on it uh, throughout the flight, but the problem was it was it was flying a little weird, and I decided I wanted high rate on the elevator. And so I flipped a switch that I knew was one of my rates. And then I thought, was that my elevator or my aileron switch? And so I looked down at the transmitter and, oh, that was aileron. So I flipped it back through the elevator switch and I looked up and I didn't have the plane. What plane? Um, you mean the gray plane in the gray sky <laughs> in the yeah, dim light? Yeah, no kidding. It should be easy um, to find. <laughs> so learn, learn to learn the lesson there that there, there is a, there is a point at which you just say it's gotten too late in the day. Mm-hmm. You know, it didn't work out today. Fortunately, you had the FPV goggles tuned in because mm-hmm. um, you were able to say, okay, I can see where you're at. And you were able to kind of bring me back and get me, get the plane yeah. oriented in a direction that you knew and that you recognized. And then I was able to see it. And then once yeah. I had the plane, I said, all right, let's go ahead and bring it on in. I said, yeah, um, like go towards the light. That's where the parking lot is. And if you're heading over there, we can bring you around to the right. That should bring it past us. And if you can't find it, then we're in deep trouble. <laughs> mm-hmm. But but it's a good thing yeah. I had that because when you lost it, you were over that small lake that was just beyond the field we were flying in. I mean, yeah. you know, you if you had lost it there, you might have lost it all the gear that is on that, you know, on mm-hmm. the Spitfire. Um, so we were able to bring you in, which was awesome. And it really was pretty neat to see how clear and bright the signal was that we're getting through the f- through the feed and that we we're able to use that to really save what would have been a disaster that day mm-hmm. and again shouldn't have flown um it didn't it didn't seem that dark until it was up in the air and i took my eyes off her for a second and i said oh it is too dark so mm-hmm. won't be flying that close to dark again um just could have been a bad situation. So mm-hmm. I apologize to everybody listening. That was not <laughs> a great example of being a good steward of the hobby. And I apologize for that. Um, so you, you went home. Um, I took her, I took the plane back, the Spitfire back out. Uh, I think it might've been the next day. Um, it was trying to fly FPV with it. Turned out the uh, micro SD card that I put into the, the, the Cyclops goggles was full. So, you know, clear that one off. I didn't get to record it, but fortunately you recorded it with your goggles. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I got to see that, but I took it out, fresh card, ready to go and went flying and everything was flying great. Had the cam, the goggles set up on top of the car. I was trying to do my first like recorded, real recorded 
set up, had the camera, up, the phone camera up on top of the car. It had the FPV goggles set up there recording and flew it around a bit and then said, OK, time to bring it in for a landing and went to set up my approach. And the where I was flying, I, I had switched back to the other side of the school entrance where we first started flying mm -hmm. and yeah. that road curves and that tree line kind of curves out from there. And I is, is a dis a distance thing. Again, I thought I was closer to me than I was. Um, as I was setting up the approach, everything was fine. Other mm -hmm. than I was setting up the approach. It was a little further out than I thought I was, which my, my approach was coming in very nice, very on, on slope, on course. Everything was great until she disappeared in the top of the trees. Oh, um, and I had tall set trees her down. <laughs> yeah, they were tall trees. I had set her down right in the top of a pine tree. I mean, just as pretty as you please. She, <laughs> she sat on the upper branches. I'm so, and, sorry to laugh at your, your misery, but I mean, what else can you do when you see your plane just sitting way at the top going like, oh. Shoot. Mm -hmm. and yeah i took the transmitter with me and i went walking back there and i i managed to find her because i started revving the the throttle so i could try to find her because mm -hmm. it was you know 30 40 50 feet back into the tree line oh, boy. and i couldn't like i was hoping she'd hit the ground but i figured she was up in the treetop and you know running the motor i finally located her. yep there she was way up there and Long story short on that one, I I went out there for I went out there again Saturday uh, to check on her, see if she'd come down, and then Sunday I went out there and she had, she had gotten blown down on Sunday. Now, hmm. that's lucky. Um, Friday night, all day Saturday and Saturday night, it rained pretty much nonstop. Uh, so between the weakening of the foam and then. I don't think we ever got any crazy wind, but it ended up being enough to dislodge it from the top branch. That's awesome. Uh, it fell down and it, it went to pieces on, on impact. Uh, the wing came off, the tail broke off. The, the nose was all crumpled. paper. Cause it'd been in the rain for two days. Like the, <laughs> the, the skin, the paper for the foam, like the paint was all bubbly yeah. and delaminated. And, oh. You know, so I kind of took some pictures and put it in a discord server so the guys could see it and sent it to you and the you know, guys in the discord. It's like, you're going to rebuild it, right? That's fixable. This set. And, <laughs> you've rebuilt that uh, thing no. way more than I know you've been comfortable with to begin with, let alone now. That, that one was truly gone. Like, yeah, and the I wing came it, yeah, back that, off, but that was half the paper back. was delaminated at that point. It was the, the wings were barely holding together. A lot of the <laughs> outside wing surfaces were ripped up. It was, so I am sad to say the Spitfire is done, at least that one, and um, I had to rebuild it. Oh shoot, a new one. You might get to <laughs> build a new one and have more fun with it. Darn it. Yeah. Oh dang. <laughs> but the nice thing was I got all the stuff back. Oh, that's um, awesome, and it all works too. Like you, your battery didn't go bad or anything. No, oh, battery's completely dead. <clears throat> well, okay, so that one's a loss, right? Yeah. Okay. But I've I've already hooked up power to it. The ESC works, motor works, the the FPV camera works. Um, oh, wow. It had it had moisture in it, so the, sure. the image was pretty rough. Cause I could see the fog on the inside of the lens, but oh. I've let it sit and dry. Yeah, and it's cleared up now. So, oh, awesome! That's not a yeah, total for, loss. So that's a twenty dollar <laughs> loss for what could have been potentially a lot more. Yeah, it's um. My my wife was with me. And I said on top of that tree and I, all I could do was look at her and say, I just put $80 in electronics on the top of that tree over there. <laughs> so that's the thing. <laughs> right. Uh, but yeah, like I said, got it all back. So well, good. I, I was so happy to see that too. So mm -hmm. happy for you. So I'll be rebuilding the Spitfire at some point in the future. It's not the next thing on the docket, but it's, it's, it'll be soon enough. Um, so with fly stories out of the way, we're, we're talking about the FAA and the new guidelines. Matthew, you've been doing a lot of reading on this over the past couple of days. So I'm going to let mm -hmm. you take point on this. Uh, okay. Uh, I will let everybody know that I have watched a great many videos that have been coming out in the last couple of days. 
Um, some of them are opinion pieces. Some of them are informational. Some of them are good. And some of them are less good. And all of them are at least entertaining, if not informative. Um, and I think there were about two or three that kind of stood out as being thorough, informative, and easy to digest. Um, and we'll put a link in these, uh, these notes uh, for this show um, down below. But <clears throat> I also then took that information uh, and I pulled up the executive summary from the FAA, which is a three-page thing, a little bit easier to digest, um, easy to read. You can get through the whole thing in, in a sitting. And then I opened up the other document, which is the the final the big rules. <laughs> yeah, the final rules of Part 89, which is a new thing. And honestly, I think if you look it up now, it'll point you to the FDA. Um, cause there's, that's where they have a part 89. Like they, it's so new now that it really hasn't even shown up in search engines yet much. Um, anyway, so, uh, if you, we have a link to the, uh, press release from the FAA and in there are links to the documents. Uh, we also will provide those links as well. Um, so, uh, I did spend some time kind of looking through the document and, corroborating what I've heard and seen over the last handful of days of videos and stuff and, and added, you know, things that I found there, there's not a whole lot. I mean, uh, most of these people who took this on, um, were pretty thorough. Um, but I just wanted to confirm it for myself that there wasn't anything like, Whoa, how did you miss that? Um, but you know, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, one of the things I think is interesting about the FAA, uh, regulation drop was that they specifically spend probably about half the document talking about the comments um, that were submitted and how they addressed a number of typical comments or comments about sections they made a ruling on one way or the other. Uh, if they made a change from the original proposal, they talked about why, if it was from comments or if it was, you know, they, or they talked about these were a bunch of comments for this section and we don't care because we're the FAA. This is our regulation. These are our rules, and we don't feel it needs to change. And you know okay. that's within your jurisdiction. So, um, and uh, part of the reason why we called it the, you know, FAA la la la, um, was mainly because uh, there's another thing. About a month ago, um, there was a big article, and we were going to cover it last episode. It was pretty fresh. We we didn't have a ton of detail. I'll, I'll kind of skim through it now. But basically, a drone operator. Uh, out of Philadelphia in November 2020, um, was levied a fine for 180, ended up being $182,000 and mm. $182,004, sorry. Um, and so I'm going to kind of read a little bit here. So if I change whatever, but, but basically uh, there is a guy, um, uh, he has a channel on YouTube called Philly Drone Life. His name is Mikey. Um, or is it Mickey? It depends on who you're talking to. Um, but I think his name is Mikey. Um, and according to Drone XL News, which is basically who kind of broke the story, I guess, um, that he received 123 infractions from the Federal Aviation Authority. That's the FAA. And, the, you know, so this pertains to the U.S. really only. But oftentimes these regulations, when they change, um, a lot of neighboring regulations tend to look at them as guidance. So it's not uncommon for other regulators to consider the rules that are put out in other jurisdictions, right? So that's okay. why we feel it's worth mentioning here. Um, so basically he said he, he received uh, fines of $1,500 for various violations, which totaled up to be $182,004. Um, they, so what he does in his channel is he will, um, it, he basically had a, a rough time of things and he found drones and it changed him around. Like it, it changed his outlook. It changed his health. It changed his mental state. It basically saved him probably from either killing himself or, or doing something, you know, basically killing himself through drug use or, I mean, I, I'm not entirely sure, but you know, he was in a bad way and drones changed that. And so he's, you know, uh, like a zealot who just 
you need to do this because it's changed me. I can only imagine what it's going to do for you, right? Um, and so what he would do is he would live stream his flights. And in that live stream, he would show himself on the controls, controlling the drone, and then he would put the telemetry da data live on the stuff. So you could see where he was, how high he was, how fast he was going, um, you know, his bank angle, his voltage, you know, all the stuff that's normally on a drone. Um, and so, uh, so from December 2019 to August 2020, the FAA went through his videos because, uh, and they issued a series of fines for infractions such as flying over 400 feet, reckless flying, flying in the rain, fog, or strong winds. So basically, when you're flying in a spot where you can't see or you can't operate the drone safely, you should not be flying. That's kind of the FAA's deal. And prior to these regulations, um, which take effect six, up to 60 days after their issuance that we've seen on the 28th, um, they'll, they'll be the new rules. Uh, but basically, the infractions, such as flying over 400 feet, and that's been kind of the longstanding rule, like don't go too high, you know, and he, you know, there's telemetry data that said he went well over 400 feet. Right. Um, so they tallied up all the times that that stuff happened over the, what is that, nine, 10 months, and put a $1,500 fine on each one of those, and voila, $182,000. Which is crazy. Well, there was also, I think you said, where he was flying too close to re what restricted airspace and yep. flying yep. in other areas that he wasn't he was, supposed to be flying in. You got it. And he was also flying over people. So anytime, you know, I mean, if he's in Philadelphia and he's flying over the streets, there's people in the streets. He's flying over vehicles. He's flying near the Philadelphia airport, which, you know, if you're in Philadelphia flying, you're flying within five miles of that airport. We're pretty close right. to it. So, you know, and anyway, uh, that is huge, and we bring it up here because that's an example of the regulatory agency saying um, this is within our jurisdiction. Like, we have the power to levy this kind of fine. It's time everybody start paying attention. And they kind of used right. him as an example because, honestly, $1,500 $1, per violation is really steep. I mean, yeah, re it's really not – compensate with the type of danger that happened. And maybe there's some instances where I could see $1,500 being part of it. Like, let's say if he got too close to the airport or something like that and endangered planes, like, okay. But anyway, they, they made their call. Um, and there, there's other things. Like, uh, he had been notified and contacted and asked to change how he flies, which I don't know if it's not entirely clear if he ignored it or if he did have conversations, but continued to do it anyway, because this is important to him. Um, and I guess he didn't think anything would happen. Um, uh, well, apparently it did. So uh, he's working through that. Now, if you, this is the way regulatory agencies work. They send you letters saying, this is the problem. And your goal, your responsibility is to call them up and talk to them about what happened in each instance. And then you can basically Either you, know, you can hire a lawyer, which isn't easy because there's only so many people who are experts as in law having to do with drones, right? It's all new. Um, right. And not too many people, you know, are willing to pay for it. So there's not too many people who have ex expertise or experience in it. Um, anyway, so there's that. And, you know, it's his job to respond to it. And if he didn't, then those levy fines kind of sit. And he's kind of stuck with it unless he challenges and whatnot. But the FAA is, they're the rule makers. They're responsible to levy fines for infractions of these regulations. And this mm -hmm. is not uncommon for, if you ask full-scale pilots, according to them, I mean, like, the, you know, like these things happen. I mean, usually it's, it's about education and a conversation before it comes to a fine. Uh, in almost right. every single case. And there's a lot of people, and we'll link, some of the people we've linked to, uh, I think Drone 51 and RC video reviews, um, those guys have said, like, yeah, they've they've been contacted on occasion by the FAA and they have a conversation and it always starts out as educational and rarely does it escalate from there. Their, their job is to make sure that you know what you're supposed to do. And so either he did and he was continuing 
um, to, to break the rules or, you know, opinions go everywhere. But I wanted you to see this as part of some of the things that the FAA has been doing recently. Uh, and I think it kind of sets a stage for everybody looking at these rules going, hmm, <clears throat> should I comply or not? And ultimately, that's outside of the scope of this discussion. Um, so on December... Well, I, I don't mind saying, I don't mind saying real quick, like, ultimately, we should comply with oh, yeah. any regulation that's set out. Look, the right. Uh, if you're going to... If you're going to disagree with it, you need to work to change it from the inside and not to do it through noncompliance. I mean, that's just setting yourself up to be in trouble. And mm -hmm. uh, I know that that's uh, – everybody's got an opinion about that. So we'll let you guys have that opinion. You're welcome to reach out to us and tell us what you think if you'd like um, at our new emails, Matthew at AviationRCNoob.com or Joe at AviationRCNoob.com. Um, you're going to enjoy that. I sure am. That's, that's great. Hey, look, it's my, it's my present. I'm going to play with it. There you go. <laughs> All right. So, uh, and so what happened is on December 28th, 2020, the United States federal aviation administration released in the unreleased final remote ID rules. Now these things, uh, just as we started the podcast, they released the proposed rule changing, and gave a comment period, which pretty much was at the end of it when we started this podcast. And, you know, 50,000 or uh, 60,000 comments were put in and, you know, they listened. Um, and it's evident if you read through the document, you'll be able to see how they listened and where they didn't. Because some of it they just said tough. Um, tough and, cookies. So the remote ID rules are now labeled as Part 89 Remote ID for Unmanned Aircraft. Now, that is not the same as unmanned aircraft systems. So UASs are not the same. That's a different definition. Um, now, keep in mind, uh, I want to put out a disclaimer here. We're not lawyers. We're not providing advice. We're just showing you what we've learned and what we understand. And, and any opinions or uh, we're, we're, our goal is to help you be aware. And we're going to provide links so that you can go and have an easier time of figuring out the stuff that you want to learn on your own. Um, you know, I don't think we can avoid having opinions about these new rules and how it affects us. As a matter of fact, part of what we, I want to have us discuss between Joe and I is, is how it's going to change what we do. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, our, should, how worried should we be or how concerned and, you know, and we'll go from there. So, but um, I, I've got a, a bunch of links that I have in the top of this section. But basically, I have three different videos um, for YouTubers that are fairly popular, or at least I have subscribed to their channel myself. And I find that their content either um, is very digestible and they do typically a pretty good thorough job of explaining things well. Um, <clears throat> or they're really strong, um, positive advocates for the hobby. And most of these mm -hmm. guys are, are, we're talking, they're RC drone people. Like they, this is what they do. They love drones and drones aren't the, the way drones are typically flown are not at a football field, like the same football field you go to every week. Right. They want right. new material. They want to go to new places. They want to explore new things with their their drone that can allow them to get places you couldn't possibly get to as a human by yourself. Right. It, it would right. require either too much money or equipment that most people aren't prepared or available able to deal with, like a helicopter, let's say. Um, so I think, I hope that, and again, these aren't endorsements of these channels. They are just what I think would be helpful for our listeners here. Um, so the CFR part 89, which is the code of federal regulations, um, it's basically talks about putting a license plate on your, uh, your unmanned aircraft. Um, and, and then basically cover how you can comply. That's essentially what the part 89 is for. Uh, it talks about that there are um, th 
three different ways to comply, right? There is a standard remote ID. There is uh, attaching a remote identification broadcast module. And so that's, that's basically for visual line of sight only. Um, you can basically put a remote module on that you maybe put from plane to plane, but you, and you can fly it, but you can only fly a visual line of sight. Uh, that's one of the limiters. Okay. If you have a standard remote ID, which is basically a plane that has it built in, um, you can go, according to that, you sh with the provisions outlined, you can go beyond visual line of sight, I believe. Um, and I cover that in more detail below. Um, and the last one is AFRIA, which is a federally recognized, or FAA recognized identification area. And essentially those are, and I'll go into detail, but basically those are the flying fields and the educational facilities. Really, I mean, it kind of boils down to that. And we'll, we'll cover what that exactly means. But basically, if you're a community-based organization, you can apply to be a FRIA. And then I, I was not able to determine if basically each FRIA has to put together, basically put a module out that transmits this location, there's planes flying, right? There's UAs flying around here at any given moment. Right. And then they basically Just are required so that, to basically have one out. And I'll go ahead. I guess that would be so that aircraft flying in the area could pick up on that signal and say, oh, there's a, a zone over here. Or is that just so that, you know, if somebody's out, you know, monitoring uh, flight right. signals, they can say, okay, there's a, there's a field that's got flyers over here. Right. Um, this signal is designed to be able to be picked up by personal devices. So okay. it is not a, an, a manned aircraft system. It's not designed to be picked up by one, and that is not the intent. The intent is basically to allow the FAA to be able to track, um, I guess... Uh, flight locations. Uh, flight, basically, and I'll get into exactly... Matter of fact, why don't we talk about what each thing actually does. But basically the goal is to allow the FAA to locate you and locate where, where your drone is. So know okay. where you started and know where your drone is and is going and, and can then thereby pass that information to local enforcement. So either local law enforcement or um, uh, what's the last one? NSA, if they need it, if they request it. Okay. okay. Otherwise, you know, anybody can figure out where you are and where you're flying, but they don't know any more information. The FAA holds that information. So they have the ID numbers of each chip. You register it, and it attaches that to your information as a pilot, and they will release the, uh, again, the information that the ID has, as well as your information upon request by law enforcement or NSA. That that's it. That's a limitation. And we're we and they are still figuring out how all this exactly is going to oh, yeah. work and be implemented. Or, right. I mean, there's talk about well, however that happens. Um, I'm paraphrasing, but but in the midst yeah. of the document, it's like, well, it's going to be this thing, and they put performance requirements on, but they have no idea what shape it's actually going to take. They have ideas. Okay. But that's about it. Okay. Um, all right. So who this applies to? No person may operate an unmanned aircraft in the airspace of the United States unless it's been registered by its owner or unless the aircraft is accepted from registration. For example, that it weighs less than 0.55 pounds or less, uh, which is the 250 gram limit. So if you have a mm -hmm. craft that is under 250 grams, you are not required to comply with this Part 89 uh, remote ID. So you do not need to put a remote ID section a thing on your on that plane. And these are more like the really small, I guess, you buy them from a store. Or if you're doing the, I guess, ultra, ultra lights. Uh, I think you're, we talked about it a little while ago, um, but that really thin... Uh, material plane that was just barely puttering along inside a gymnasium. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a vapor. Yeah. So um, really, really small aircraft. And 
the idea, I guess, is if it fails and it lands on somebody or something, the damage caused by it is going to be either non-existent or inconsequential. Um, mm -hmm. So let's go through, I guess, the quick definition of what they call an unmanned aircraft or un unmanned aircraft system. So the term unmanned aircraft system in this document means an unmanned aircraft and associated elements. So that's including the communication links, the components, and the controls of that unmanned aircraft. Um, and these are required for the operator to operate safely and efficiently in the national airspace system. Okay. So let's go into detail about the first type of compliance, which is standard remote ID, where the broadcast is built into the purchased craft. Right. So the manufacturer makes this, they propose a system to the F FAA, the FAA approves it, and it gets put in the aircraft in a manner that cannot be tampered with. Okay. And so, so it, any of your like pre built, uh, almost ready to flies, the larger ready to flies and such. Right. And, and I say larger because I think back to the little, what, C 180 or something. Mm -hmm. little, foam form thing you had that would sit in your palm yeah yeah and i think that one is 87 grams dripping wet so that doesn't okay. need to comply right but when you get to double the size of that or well, i guess that's triple the size that's where you start needing something mm, yeah roughly um okay so let's talk about what these systems broadcast right so they broadcast the um, unmanned aircraft identification so they broadcast a serial number, <clears throat> which the, you know, the FAA then links to your information if they need to. Uh, it then uh, also transmits the latitude, the longitude, the altitude, the speed of the aircraft, and the control station latitude, longitude, uh, altitude of the takeoff point. And, and ultimately, that's the difference, I think, between... The standard remote ID and this the broadcast module is there's a small difference where the standard will it'll transmit the <clears throat> uh, the control station lat and line so it'll be in the transmitter that comes with it um, and then there's uh, any uh, the emergency status so let's say you fail safe it'll let Basically, the FAA know when you lost control or when the plane had an error. So if right. damage happens after, they know, like, okay, well, that wasn't you. Um, and then a timestamp. So when you say, hey, I totally wasn't there on noon when that fire happened, they can say, right. hey, yeah, you were. <laughs> you were. <clears throat> and part of it is, um, anyway, so, okay, so then the message will be available on all uh, to everybody in range of the broadcast to hear with a wireless device, uh, and it correlates, and then it correlates the serial number or UI, UAID with the database. Uh, that information, that correlation, will be limited to the FAA, which can then be authorized to be given to law enforcement or NSA personnel upon request. So the FAA okay. holds it so, tight unless requested by specific people. Right, so it's not that just anybody's going to be able to go out, sniff in on your signals that you're having to broadcast, and then pull all kinds of information out of for you. Or well, they you. won't it's... know who it is. So they will see right. that ID, let's say 1806, let's say is my plane. It will say 1806 ground station and 1806, and it'll have the lat line speed and all the information I just talked about. And that'll be showing up on the system. So as you're broadcasting, you can basically look at it, and it'll tell you where it is. But it but won't tell you that that's... is some sort of ID that right. within the FAA holds they can figure out. your right. information, and the FAA is not going to let just anybody get a hold of that. Right, exactly. Hopefully. And so what they'll say is, uh, hey, I've got a bad, uh, a bad actor, and it's UAID 1806. They don't know that 1806 is Joe or Matt, right? Like they just Hopefully know it's that not. it's 1806. <laughs> well, that's the thing is, is that's for the FAA then to tell, hey, um, local law enforcement, go out and see what this guy's doing. 
Um, if right. he's not there when you get there, this is his address. You know, go go talk to him about things, right? Um, possibly. I mean, that that's a scenario. I mean, who knows exactly? But that's what that's what it's set up for. Um, and then the range can basically the range of this device uh, has to be with the broadcast module has to be as much as the aircraft can manage. So it's designed to maximize the range. Okay. Okay. So like on our cameras, right, we have a 50, 100, and 200 milliwatt setting. I think in 25, uh, right? Uh, I can't remember. I don't know. Some of the cameras do. <laughs> some of the all-in-one. You've got all that. Some of the all-in-one transmitters, some of the transmitter modules, they have variable, variable strength. Um, right. And so you would be setting it always on the highest setting. Is all uh, okay? So then we go to the remote broadcast module. So that is a p separate standalone piece that you that does not come with a plane. You install it, and so and we'll talk about it. But that essentially allows you to put it into an already existing plane. A lot of the comments were, "Dude, I, I have about five hundred planes. I'm not going to buy a whole new group of planes. If you do this and you require me to buy one for every single plane, I'm out. I'm out." Right. Just, you know, and they're like, well, that's that's not what we aim for. So here you can buy a broadcast module and you can carry it from thing to thing, kind of like our receivers. Right. Um, it allows mm -hmm. for retrofits of the unmanned aircraft. Um, but the broadcast module has to be must be linked to the registration record and uh, uh, record for the unmanned aircraft. So you have to link it together. Uh, and it functions just like the standard remote ID. The the limitation with the broadcast module is that it must be operated with visual line of sight. There are conditions where the standard remote ID module, where the broadcast thing is built in, you can do predetermined flight, uh, what is that called? <clears throat> flight plans. And those mm -hmm. flight plans may go beyond visual line of sight. And that, in this, as long as they're cast it you know putting out remote id that's okay okay and they're required to so that allows you to go beyond visual line of sight but if you have a pre-built model or you make your own you can put the broadcast module in it but you have to keep it in visual line of sight and this broadcast module is more i assume how we're going to be uh complying with all this yeah now uh, is that saying that each of our planes that we build then need to be registered as its own unique unmanned aircraft because i know <clears throat> you me not so much but you really roll through them <laughs> um, so are you going to be registering each one of your planes under this or uh, is it that that module is I, registered just, and you can put it in whatever right and th there was a number of comments that addressed that basically highlighted that for the faa saying like look i i got too many of these things like there's no way i'm identifying every individual plane I, by the time you guys realize what plane i have i'm already down three more planes i'm already on the third plane mm -hmm. down the line like you, you gotta be kidding me so what they said is uh you basically have to identify that you are flying a you know foam plane you know just identify that you're flying a certain plane that that's you and you're attached to this you know you're registered and it's you know with this broadcast module okay and I assume we're probably going to see more verbiage on that come out as things I, progress. I think so. And there is some more details in there about what that specifically means. Um, but what I could quickly see was that it's pretty much, you have to basically say, I'm flying a craft. And here's the remote ID. Okay. You know. And it may not, like the, the pre-built ones will have, uh, you're flying a uh, Renegade Wing, right? Model X23. Right. That's, that's what you're flying. That is the model. Okay, cool. But this is different. You know, this allows you a little bit more flexibility. And that was the point of it. They wanted to make sure that if you're a custom builder or you're... Um, you have existing models that you'll be able to fly them. Okay. Uh, and then I think this last piece is the one that um, I think you can thank AMA, the Academy of Mar Model Aeronautics, 
um, for putting their weight into the ring and shoving it around a bunch. Um, so basically, it's a federally recognized identification area. So it is a FRIA, and that's basically a bounded area that when you, when they register, so when the community organization registers this site, they put a bounding box on it, and then the FAA just basically says, if you go outside of it, you're in violation. As long as you're inside, you're good. Go fly. Have fun. Keep in visual line of sight. If you go outside of it without the proper modules on board, <clears throat> you're in right. violation. Right. It says, okay, so it's a geographic area recognized by the FAA of where your unmanned aircraft can fly. Um, eligible organizations can apply to become a FRIA and community-based orgs, so usually AMA-sponsored fields. Uh, FT Community Association is an example of one. Uh, the primary, secondary trade schools, colleges, and universities all are um, allowed to become FRIAs. Okay. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they will be, but that's for us citizens to implore the local school systems to apply to become a FRIA. And mm -hmm. I don't know if it would be worthwhile to um, approach the individual schools or would it be worthwhile to approach the county school systems? Yeah, because that was something you and I had talked about is you know, to to get the local schools uh, mm -hmm. as free as or one of the local schools as a free. And I said, well, it might be that by the time all this comes out, like, I'm looking to, we don't have a, we don't have a flying club in my area anymore. We used to, uh, strangely enough, they used to fly out by the air base. Um, <laughs> yeah, I thought that was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's where they used to fly. But that was, you know, 30 years ago, uh, right. 25 ish. Yeah. I vaguely remember seeing them out there. Yeah. Um, but the, there's a thought that, well, maybe I get with the school districts and see about, either the school or the school district and see about trying to get a flying club set up out at one of those locations where mm -hmm. other members in the community who maybe want to get into flying can come out, but also it could serve as a, uh, an after school activity for, you know, the school kids. Mm -hmm. And that may justify them wanting to, you know, get involved mm -hmm. and set up a free at one or more of their locations. Right. And maybe, and we can talk about possible strategies as I continue. Well, this year has almost been a wash, but as my son is in the middle school, I was planning to approach the middle school about if they haven't starting maybe an RC after school club um, mm -hmm. for kids who want to learn how to fly uh, RC and build and design and, and use that as part of the curriculum to engage them and engage the math and science skills and stuff. So, um, Anyway, we can we'll tackle that probably some other day, but let's continue on as there's enough material to last forever. No. It was again, it was about a <laughs> three hundred page document, you know, and about hundred and fifty of it is how they addressed uh comments. And it's just it's a lot. I mean it's a normal technical document by the government. So it's uh concise is not always the case. So all right. So uh, one of the requirements of the FRIA is that when you, while you're operating in there without a remote ID, you must operate it in visual line of sight. Okay. Okay. Um, applications are, so this is one of the things that was a big sticking point when the proposal was given, was that they basically had a period that you could become a FRIA. I think it was a short period, about like six to eight, six to 12 months, I think. And then, mm -hmm. or maybe even 18 but once and the applications you were free, were shut down completely. There, right. There was no applications in the future. You were done. Like that was all you're going to get. And if you're one cool, you got the benefit of being a Freya. Otherwise, which was really not that, like we talked about it. That's not a great benefit. It's like 400 foot circle from where you stand. Like, well, my runway on my site, on my flying field is 800 feet. Yeah. I mean, that's ridiculous. So that basically means you take off and you need to turn around. Like that's, mm -hmm. that doesn't make any sense. Anyway, uh, anyway, so um, you have to operate within visual and but then they basically said that similarly, the application period is 18 months and then similar, you can continue to submit after that um, and the authority and you'll basically be given authority for 48 months 
to operate as a FRIA. And of course, you can continue to renew it. And it's subject to termination by the FAA for safety or security reasons. So basically saying okay. like, look, if you want to be one, you sign up. Um, you can continue to you know, make new submissions if you change your field. And you can and you have it for four years. Every four years, you have to update it. Okay. So they opened that up so that mm -hmm. it wasn't just one and done, no more fields. You know, we're, we're able to, as groups pop up and fall off, we're able mm -hmm. to apply and request. And there's uh, that uh, wiggle room yeah. that we're able to, to have f new fields set up, you know, maybe four or five years after all this goes into effect. Right. And, and if you're one of the hobbyists and our listeners who submitted comments to that effect, basically saying, look, I fly to field. If you do this, I, I don't see the point in going, you know, pat mm -hmm. yourself on the back between you and AMA and other organizations like flight test. It's mentioned a couple of times, um, you know, they pat themselves on the back, uh, pat yourselves on the back. Cause that those comments and those, I'll call it, um, concentration points of hobby opinion um really their comments had an uh, impact on the how the faa remolded the frias because now there isn't that 800 foot window like it's like you tell us what you need okay and we'll set it aside and if somebody spots you outside of that you'll be in trouble yeah <laughs> and if you're doing dangerous stuff we might shut you down but by all means, make a submission, join us. You have it for, eight, uh, for four years and you can renew it. Or if you need to move somewhere else, go ahead. So again, uh, call up your AMA um, representatives if you're part of a field and thank them. You know, thank, thank everybody for doing their part and making sure that the traditional, again, I'll, I'll call it traditional. So the, the balsa hobbyist, you know, balsa flying hobbyist, they're... Uh, They've, they've kept most of that uh, intact. And note that there is no limit to elevation. You know, uh, there may be a limit at your site if you're near certain, you know, restricted airspaces and things like that. You might not have, you may not be able to operate over 400 feet, but I mean, it doesn't identify here how, like if there's a cap in that area, as far as I saw. Would that not... Uh piggyback the existing uh mm -mm. flight ceilings the, these rules replace the previous rules hmm. well actually let me see they these rules are from remote id so i suppose they still have the 400 foot cap that might be worth saying if we can get a um our local i can get our local ama uh field rep to come out and just talk to us about that but um, that's a good point. They might overlap. They made the previous ones. Um, but I, as I understand it, I thought that these rules essentially override pre-existing rules. So you may still be stuck at 400 feet, but that's still yeah, pretty high. They, they seem like a these are overruling or replacing existing parts, uh, but anything is not touching on is probably still going to be in effect. Right. And honestly, so. if you know differently or want to let us know what you're thinking about that or what you know about that, if you uh, have specific information, go ahead and reach out to us in our emails. That's Matthew at AviationRCNoob.com or Joe at AviationRCNoob.com. You, you, you're killing me with that. <laughs> Come on. I'm, I'm playing with my present. Okay. Uh, the go. next thing is, uh, so now that we've covered basically the three ways you can comply, right? Um that brings us to design and production rules. So basically, these are the guiding guidelines that manufacturers are going to use to create, sell, distribute, employ these remote ID uh, units, right? So the FAA is required to review and approve of modules or uh, unmanned aircraft that use uh, the standard remote ID or the broadcast modules. Um, and the rule states that basically uh, the performance requirements to set, up, uh, set equipment for the remote ID or the remote broadcasting module, um, uh, basically the rules include like what, what's required, right? It has to transmit that certain amount of data. 
It has to do those things. So it has to be able to do that. If you can't, then it doesn't, it's not okay. Um, uh, the FAA must accept it. Uh, and that acceptance must be achieved prior to use in the, the unmanned aircraft. So okay. these boards have to be okayed, kind of like with the cameras, have to be approved by the FCC Part 15 to really be used in stuff, right, in America. So the FAA has to approve these modules prior to these manufacturers installing them and basically including it as remote ID aircraft and selling them that way. Okay. So... Um, so also the unmanned aircraft must self-test and self-test positive prior to function. So it has to boot up and confirm that everything's working hunky dory before it allow anybody to arm it. So it has to be able to be broadcasting and getting the data, the barometer and GPS data before it takes off. Okay. And it has to... I assume it also has a self-test that it's transmitting. So is that somehow going yeah, to sure. potentially tie into our transmitters for our, like telemetry data? Or is that just, no, everything on board, like all the diagnostics check out, I should be transmitting, we're good to go. Exactly. Otherwise, we're adding additional components to our transmitters. Does that does that make sense? Right. I, and I'm, I think it's more of, it's like a power kill override, that the power doesn't reach to the rest of the system unless all these things check out on board the chip or the broadcast system. And if it does, then cool, we'll let the power go like an on off switch, I guess internally. Okay. So, um, let's see the remote ID. Uh, most importantly, the remote ID can't be tampered with or disabled by the user. So no putting tinfoil. I guess that's one way to get around it, but I wasn't suggesting that. My point is, is you want it to be tampered. That's technically tampering. Yeah, it is. It is. You know, I mean, but that's not something that the manufacturer can really do anything about. But you design it so that it's got like, you know, a box on top or some way that the average user can't get to it. Right. Anybody who's determined will get to it. But the average user shouldn't be able to. Um, right. <clears throat> and you must use, the, like we talked about before, the maximum range allowed by the unlicensed radio frequency device or that's allowed on an unlicensed uh, radio frequency device, device capable of receipt by the person, by a personal wireless device. That's what I was talking about earlier. That basically either through Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, that that's where it's going to be sending the signal, probably 5.8 gigahertz. And or some other protocol that's, that's brought up, designed, negotiated, approved. Right. And it can be accepted by a personal, by a phone, basically. Mm-hmm. So whatever that ends up being. And I think that's kind of where they're like, we're not sure what it's going to be, but it has to do this. So that's your problem. Um, you know, uh, but anyway, I it's mean, a, yeah. it's a big requirement. What? As a, I mean, yeah, that, go ahead. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, also, if you are not a United States citizen and you want to register your civil unmanned aircraft to operate in the U S let's say, you're in the drone world racing leagues and the world hosts it in America. Can you come with your drone and operate it in the, in the airspace, United States airspace, even though you're from insert other country, right? Well, it's right. say that basically we're allowing provisions for that. So it's possible if the operator files a notice of identification with the FAA and allowing allows local law, law enforcement to correlate the unmanned aircraft with re, the responsible person. So it's basically saying, while you're here, uh, you're going to let us know who you are and where you're from and allow us to pass that to people to correlate you with your drone while you're here. Okay. Are they also required to carry an onboard uh, broadcast module or just uh, supplying said information is going to be sufficient? It seems or like it's... Uh, supplying the information, I think, seems to be what's required. Again, this is the language, I believe, that I pulled from the document itself. It says, possible, it's possible if the operator files notice of identification with the FAA and allows okay. local law to correlate the unmanned aircraft with the responsible person. So basically you're saying, hey, 
if the AFFA needs to let local law enforcement know about your craft, you're submitting the information that links the two. You're providing mm-hmm. basically a broadcast thing, and you're okay. You you sign a waiver that allows local law enforcement to use that data if they need to. No, okay. Basically. So, I mean, that's pretty straightforward, and that allows for, you know, flight tests and all that with, uh, you know, we have a lot of Canadian friends and other, and we've got the crazy Swede, right? uh, uh, David Vindenstahl, who has right. helped out with, I mean, they made the Vigan. Um, you know, he comes out to flight test, and so he allows him to come over and fly. And, you know, in many senses, that's kind of what you want. I mean, you want other people to be able to come and enjoy the hobby, but... How do you do that and make sure your airways are safe, right? Right. All right. So that brings us to, hopefully that's clear enough. Um, but just, it lets you know what the, I guess, what the burden is on the producers. producers. So I don't know how that's going to affect people like uh, the Hangar RC or Flight Test. Because um, what they're producing is kits that, are all the parts and pieces, they're not assembled. I mean, basically, if they send, sell a kit, do they sell a remote broadcasting option with it? And as long as they're doing right. that, they're complying. I, I, it's not really clear from what I read. I mean, maybe somebody knows. And if you do, please, you know, send, send us a line, let us know. Um, but uh, so the next section is the home build aircraft. And that's kind of where you and I come in, right? And that's kind of why I highlighted it. There's a whole section I'm going to read here. Um, on page 43 of the FAA response uh, regarding home-built aircraft, the FAA agrees with commenters that, un- and this is kind of the language that they use throughout this document, the FAA agrees with commenters that unmanned aircraft are not built by hobbyists with the same degree of fabrication as amateur-built manned aircraft. These rules, uh, this rule removes the major portion requirement the definition now includes that any unmanned aircraft that an individual built solely for education or recreation. Uh, this def- definition will include any level of assembly of the unmanned aircraft so long as that assembly is done solely for education or recreation of the individual building, the UAS. Okay. Okay. So basically it's saying it defines kind of what that means. Like, how, yes, we expect you'll be putting things together, but it has to be solely for education or recreation, which is essentially what we do. Um, right. The Otherwise, FAA, we're getting into the more commercial side of the of the hobby. Right. And then part uh, 89 does not govern, and it's part 107. Part 107 is the FAA regulation that permits commercial use of unmanned aircraft. And we'll touch okay. a little bit on it, um, only because with this new regulation came a couple of additions to Part 107 that I think are interesting. Um, and so what happens if you're monetizing your thing, and we'll, we'll get into a couple quick cases at the end of this, um, you may be stepping out of Part 89 and stepping in to Part 107, whether or not you are registered or not. Right. <clears throat> right. The regulations pertain to the activity, not whether or not you're uh, registered that way. Right. You may not okay. be registered, that. but your activity is of this class and thereby is governed by these regulations. Now, if you, if you get in trouble and you don't have a 107, the first thing on that list of here's $1,500 of fine is you don't <laughs> have part 107, right? You're not a part right. 107 registered pilot, so. All right, so let's continue with home-built. The FAA considers the individual constructing the home-built unmanned aircraft, uh, even if through assembly alone, is not responsible for meeting the production requirements of that final rule, so of the one I just talked about. The hobbyist assembling an unmanned aircraft from a complete kit that contains all the parts and instructions to assemble the unmanned aircraft will, would not be responsible for meeting the production requirements of this rule. However, the company that produced the complete kit would be required to meet the production requirements. 
So if somebody's selling a kit with all the parts and pieces, like here's your drone, here's the frame, here's the motors, here's the stuff, here's the flight controller, and here's your broadcast unit. And it's, Broadcast unit has to be in there. And the only way you can connect kit. it is it direct connects to the flight board or something like that where there's no other way it'll work. Mm-hmm. Let's turn it out. So, uh, and flight test will have to do something similar. I don't, I'm not, still not quite sure how the foam board kits work because I mean, essentially you're providing the entire thing. Um, would that be then I'd imagine it basically qualify into that second category of the remote broadcast unit. Right. You know, and that be an optional ad because if you already have one, why would you want to buy a new one? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. And then, so as discussed, so, so in that case, it's more, they, the manufacturer has the, the option for you to get it but if you've already got it you know you don't necessarily have to get it just right. it the end result is it still has to have said module mm-hmm. and, it, and it may okay. be that they may be required to sell you these modules anyway so they can sell the kit well i know something you and i were talking about before is that um as this comes out and as it gets designed everything all all the moving pieces figure out how they're all going to fit together. We may it may be possible that receivers say, and this is strictly talking about our portion of the hobby, but receivers that we buy for our planes might have you know a lot of this stuff on board out right. the gate. You know, instead of paying twenty five dollars for our however much for a receiver, we may have to pay thirty five forty dollars, but it's got this capability on board. And that's basically if you're re- if you're using it to fly, it's complying with Part eighty nine, right? Right. Exactly. Okay. Um, and I, I think this next section kind of corroborates that. So, as discussed in section seven of this preamble, uh, persons operating these unmanned aircraft continue to be subject to operating rules of Part eighty nine. So, a home built unmanned aircraft without remote identification can only be operated <clears throat> in a FRIA unless it can identify remotely in accordance with the rule. Uh, For example, so if you build an unmanned aircraft and you don't have one of the broadcast units, you can still fly it and you can fly it at a FRIA, a designated zone that FAA has acknowledged, recognized, and approved. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you will need a remote identification broadcast module. Okay. Um, Then they go on to talk about, because there's a lot of, uh, I guess a lot of talk in the comments and the initial rules that uh, are we going to be carrying around an ADSB or an ATC? Those are um, basically the broadcast modules that are on full full sized or manned aircraft, and they right. transmit where the aircraft is at all times. Right, uh, full ma- manned aircraft does this already. It's already part of their rules. They, if you matter of fact, you can go. I don't know what the website is, but you can go onto a website and look at where all the aircraft are at this very minute. I sat in my office watching airplanes literally fly past the office and looking up out the window and watching them fly across the sky. So it was neat to be able to see it real time on the computer and, Mm -hmm. you know, in the sky at the same time. So essentially that's kind of what they're doing with this system is what I take. And piggybacking off that and straying just a touch, uh, but on that point, it's not, I've seen where it's not just done through a website. Um, They're, big explosion in, a, in another hobby um mm-hmm. but software defined radio they figured out uh and they were able to tune it in and you can listen in to planes mm-hmm. within range of it you know just sitting at home and have a you yeah know, i think they were doing it with like the the fire sticks and so there were certain like tv sticks that they figured out you could uh flash Actually. them with software and you know turn it into a software defined radio and you were able to listen in to to those yeah. signals, uh, among other signals, but yeah, 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 all the baby monitors you can stomach. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know about that. Uh, well, that used to be the thing. You'd be able to tune your baby monitor into other frequencies and listen to, you know, your neighbor's conversation on a cell phone way back in the day. You know that kind of thing. Ooh. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, look, it was new. Um, okay, so let's talk about uh, education, right? Uh, FAA's biggest concern at least as stated, is that they're about education first. They want people to just know that 
what the rules are and make sure you're aware and you're operating within them. If you don't know, it's not an excuse, but at the same point, they'll just, you know, make sure you know it, you know? So the education is different though. Uh, they basically will have a test um, and there essentially won't be like a recurrent test. So it used to be that you would take your, let's say part 107 and you'd become a certified pilot under 107 as a drone operator. And then every two years you have to go back and take another test. And now that test was, it was really just parts and pieces from the manned aircraft pilot certification. I mean, there were whole things on weather patterns and how to read the zone maps that I've never seen as a unmanned aircraft operator. Never once right. have I ever looked at these maps. Like as a manned aircraft, yeah, that's how you live and breathe, but you better know it. Well, unless I'm trying to figure out how close I am to an airport. You know, I never look at the darn things. Anyway, so they basically said that uh, they're going to have a, you basically have a knowledge test and then you have to be recertified every 24 months. And like as a professional engineer, it's very similar, right? Like every year I have to spend 14 hours learning something about my industry, keeping up to date and making sure I'm aware of what's new. Right. So this is similar. So, so is this a, is this a requirement on us as the pilots. hobby pilots? Is that what you're saying? Yes. If you're going to use remote ID and not just show up at free then you need to go and basically have somebody certify that you have working knowledge of this, you know, part 89. Okay. And it's where at the FAA testing centers, I think you, but they were likely to have an online component or you could go to a third party certifier. Like, uh, I think I was talking to Ken, I wasn't talking about, I was watching Ken Heron's channel and he is sponsored by drone 101 and they do that service. So they, they get people part 107 certified. So they'll look at this as one of those things where you just kind of say, Hey, I paid you six, $9 for a lifetime of certs. And you just show up every two years and they say, here's the stuff. Do you know it? And they go, yeah, here's a couple of quick questions. You're good. Sign you off. Good to go. See you in two years. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm probably being more nonchalant about it than it really is, but It'll be that kind of thing, I think. It, that's, I think, the intent. Um, and then the last thing is the timeline of this implementation from manufacturers to when we have to abide by it, right? It doesn't happen tomorrow. Um, so 60 days of issuance of this regulation, proposed regulation. I, it's actually not proposed. So it'd be, it just, the, the issuance of this ruling and it'll be ratified and basically installed in 60 days. Um, 18 months after that, it, the manufacturers need to be on board with making components. So all the manufacturing requirements are required 18 months from the start of this. Okay. And then after that, uh, 30 months is the implementation and enforcement begins. Now, is that 30 months, 30 months from the end of the 18 or is that 30 months from the 60 day 30 months from the start from the 60 day okay so you got 18 months for manufacturers and then 12 months beyond that is for, when right for it's us implemented to and being enforced exactly and for basically us okay. to make sure we're complying in whatever way and then after that you we might be held liable which you know uh, so it's not happening tomorrow and the good news is we have two and a half years to figure out the best way to handle it and if, if you're part of the drone world, even remotely, you've seen that in two and a half years, the leaps and bounds of components, uh, just ability of the aircraft, like it used to be really hard to get these things to stabilize. And now it comes set up, ready to go, like you're a drone racer. Like you are mm -hmm. ready to go, literally. And it's more a matter of preferences that you're shifting things around, not because it's not a good flyer to begin with. Back in the day, it was not a good flyer, and it needed a lot of work <laughs> to tune it, you know, and get it to fly halfway decent. Um, and I'm talking, you know, eight years ago. But we've also seen with the push of the 250-gram limit, which is a limit that is imposed 
in most of Europe. Um, it's looking like it's going to be imposed in Australia and a number of other places. I don't have my pulse on Russia or anything like that, or Africa for that matter. But it seems like those seems to be the common limiter. And I think that, as I heard it, it's like an offhanded comment. Somebody like, ah, oh, yeah, if it's any more than, you know, two sticks of butter, it's going to kill you. Or it's going to do some damage. <laughs> right. And they're like, well, how much is two sticks of butter weigh? <laughs> 0.55 pounds. Oh, look at that. All right, two, two to 50 grams. Um, I don't know. I, that's, that's hearsay. So um, that seems to be the limit. So what we'll probably see is a whole slew of craft, like the, the ZOHD, so Zod Dart, is a sub-250 aircraft that has uh, INAV-capable flight controller. It has GPS. It has um, a barometer, uh, FPV system, transmitter, you know, camera, uh, right. and a solid motor and propeller, and it's lightweight, for designed for long range. So it is set for you to just do what ever you want within compliance of the guidelines. But basically it doesn't fall. You do not need remote ID for this. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, if it's under 250 grams, because you will not yeah. fall into this regulation. A matter of fact, you won't fall into hardly any regulations under 250 grams. Most of that is, seems to be a limit for most of them. Well, it'll just be important then if that's going to be the case that, those operating craft under the 250 gram uh, operate responsibly. Absolutely. Let, let's hope so, right? Otherwise, these regulations will call it, reach further into the hobby, right? Um, yeah. And it, so the interesting thing is what we saw with a lot of components when the quadcopters started, they were a distribution board, there were ESCs, there were motors, there was a flight, all of these separate components. But nowadays, you can take the same size chip that was the size of the distribution board and everything is on that one thing except the motors. Yeah. You know, and so that saves a ton of weight. So, and honestly, they've gotten smaller than 30 by 30 millimeter. Uh, now they're like 20 by 20 or even 15 by 15. So you're looking at toothpick size and the smaller you get, the smaller the motors can get, the lighter weight. And I don't know if you've been following battery technology, but solid state batteries are coming fast and furious which means they're like half the weight for two times the amount of storage, which means you're going to see sub-250 long-range craft built with plenty of room to spare, which should be, hmm. should be a lot of fun as long as we don't abuse it, like you said. Be good stewards. Right. You know, continue not to do foolish things, and you should be okay. Um, I wanted to touch on – I mentioned that Part 107 had a quick – uh, a quick rule drop, basically, at about the same time they said, hey, with this remote ID, if you're doing it, which you'll have to, um, we're going to, because we'll know what you're doing and when you're doing it and how you're doing it, we're okay with certain extensions of the limitations of Part 107. Uh, one of them is basically night flight. You've always been able to kind of do it as a recreational pilot, but as a commercial pilot, it's like, no, no, you cannot do it. Um, right. So they have some limitations. And I think the biggest one is basically putting on a strobe that's visible for three nautical miles. So if you're flying an aircraft, other craft up there need to see you if it's at night. So you can't be invisible. No, that makes sense. It does. Uh, and they also said that flight over people. And uh, without getting into all the details, because what they did is they started defining – categories of part 107 craft so category one is small like just over 250 up to like I don't know, a pound or so let's say uh and then the next class is one to five pounds the next class after that is five to 15 and the one after that is like 15 to 55 after 55 you're in a totally different class of you know unmanned aircraft right um and so they have those categories and they basically say okay in those categories, they outline how you can fly over people. They say, basically, if you're in a flight path that goes over people, um, if it's uh, part of the routine path and it's limited exposure, don't worry. You're good. You can do that. If you're going to fly a mission that is over a group of people, you need to let them know that's happening 
and let everybody be aware. Like, so if you're flying a construction site to do, let's say, survey, right, um, an aerial survey, you just have to let people know, like, we are flying an unmanned drone here, and it's going to be here from this time to this time. And then as long as that's in part of the safety meeting that day, you're good to go. Good to go. Yep. Uh, with one other caveat. And the biggest, and this is probably the biggest caveat, and it makes a lot of sense. If you're flying over people, you need to safeguard your propellers. You cannot lacerate people if it crashes. Right. That's pretty much it. And I could be wrong. I think, I, well, I don't know. I think a lot of the quads I've been seeing already have the the prop guards on them. A lot of the smaller ones do. Um, and they're designed to be like cinematic uh, following drones that are supposed to follow somebody who's on a motocross or something like that, where if you bump into them cause you went too fast and they turned and slam into them, you don't want to hurt them. Right. So right. they have prop guards. Uh, matter of fact, I've got but one. Then I too. guess, yeah, you're right. There's a lot of them I've seen that don't have any sort of prop guard protection. And the, the bigger you get, the harder that is to accomplish. Yeah. Really? Cause I mean, what are you going, to, how are you going to safeguard if a 25 pound craft comes crashing into a building what prop guards are you going to put on there that's going to stop the propeller from lacerating somebody mm -hmm. if the propellers are going? Like, I, I find that hard to... So, likely, the bigger the craft, the the most, the most less likely it will be flying over people. You know? That makes sense. It does. Uh, so, I mean, it seems pretty sensical. And there's a lot of people who are pretty excited that, okay, as a commercial drone operator, I don't have to get a waiver. Oh, that was the other thing. Um, the big thing was they're like, okay, all these questions, these requests for waivers, the answer is going to be no. Comply oh. or tough. Okay. We've given you enough latitude. You should be able to work within this. There are very few small, limited, I you know, defined exceptions that we might consider, but don't. Generally, don't ask. We're done. Hmm. I mean, they were getting requests constantly. And they yeah. had the, the land system, which basically you'd start up your drone. You say, I'm here. I want to buy some insurance. Here's some insurance. Okay, cool. FAA, I'm here doing this thing, operating in this, you know, corridor. And they said, and said, can you approve this flight? And they say, thumbs up or thumbs down. And it was almost immediate, usually. It was awesome. Yeah. Um, why? And I think it was probably putting a burden on their staff and they may have wanted to limit that especially if you're thinking okay that's a recreational users that's not even getting in to the amazons and the ups's and the dhl's right right which this is going to open up a whole can of worms in that department yeah exactly all right um with all that said i want to restate our disclaimer joe and i are not <laughs> lawyers we, we're not providing advice. We're simply stating what we have observed, read, and and our, these opinions are in an effort to create awareness and to help and help you guys by providing links. So, uh, and we have a, we'll have a list of links at the end of this. There's like six or seven of these things. Um, I think we're going to have more links in this episode than we've had in any other. Uh, it's it's worthwhile. And some of them are, you know, we're going to have the ham radio link. We'll have the goggle comparison video that I did. Uh, if we can get your Spitfire link or pictures in, we want to make sure to link to that. We've got the FAA yeah. Gov press release, the actual FAA Part 89 final rules. We have the three different YouTuber videos that cover this in a different format. Uh, again, all of which are digestible and interesting um, it just depends on how you like to hear it and how much time you have. Although most of them are, you know, on the order of this, it's like an hour of just listening to this stuff. Um, yeah. And don't it's forget hard not to cover this material without it being a longer topic. I, I feel that an hour dedicated to a hundred pages or sorry, 300 pages of material is fair. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, <laughs> Okay, so I also, before we, you know, I, I want to talk about what we think about this. And then I want to, before we go, I want to talk about, uh, remind everybody about some of the events that we've got, uh, some of the things we're looking forward to doing and the requests we've made so far. 
But so Joe, now those are all the rules. That's a, that's a lot, right? But most of them yeah. seem to be parsed down at a, a couple basics, right? You either buy something with it in there and you can kind of, as long as you're using it and not tampering with it, you can kind of go hog wild. Just know you're going to be linked to your activities. Yeah. Be careful. And the other one is you can do whatever you want with whatever you make, but keep it so you can still see it. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do. Within three years. Right. Or, no, and that's basically, that's the putting in your own broadcast unit. You oh, do whatever yeah, you yeah. want and you could you just make sure you can see it with a naked eye and a, a naked eye being uh, aided for normal vision. Like, you know, I've got glasses, so that counts, but no binoculars. Right. Yeah. If you can't see it, if you need binoculars, you, you've gone too far. <laughs> Come back. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I think that's fair. Um, generally, that keeps people in a reasonable range. Um, I, I know a lot of people aren't happy about that, but. Um, or you can also have a remote spotter. That's the other thing. <clears throat> I think you can have somebody who's further down the road who can see it. As long as they can see it the whole time between you and them and you're in communication, you're good. Uh, what that facilitates is if I'm doing um, a utility line inspection, I can have a guy at the turn. And so I fly it out to the turn in the line, and then they continue out to the next turn spot. And then when the drone comes back, we get together, we go to the next spot. And it allows us to cover more ground faster. Otherwise, it's, you know, we're kind of wasting utility money. Okay. It wouldn't be the only place for it. But uh, that's uh, that's one of the things. And, and then operating in a Freo, just kind of like you already have. Just don't go outside of it and get tattled on. Like If you're outside, come back and uh, don't do anything dangerous with it. You know? Yeah. And where it sounded like you were heading with that was that you were going to try, you wanted my thoughts and my impression on all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which. Because you look, you've been in this hobby for a little over a year. This is all new. I mean, you barely even know, like, what, what do I have to do? <laughs> what are these rules here? <laughs> uh, I just know yeah. I don't go too far out. And I, and besides, you need to be able to see it any way to fly it. So it's like, okay. Mm -hmm. And you're flying at a school or a park or somewhere with open fields or you have permission from the owner, which, you know, yeah. that's pretty much what the rules are currently. Um, you know, it's mixed feelings on it. Like I say, I hadn't been in it too long. Um, it, I would rather that this kind of stuff not need to be, uh, put out like this. I, I'd rather that r rules and regulations like this, not have to be implemented um that said i'm generally a person that if they are being implemented they're being implemented for a reason either mean, somebody was like like somebody or multiple people were doing things that they didn't need to be doing and thus we need to address this or it's in preparation for other things that are coming down the pipeline yeah. both both of which are fairly true of this case we've got right. You know, and you've cited examples, but yeah, you know, there there are folks that don't, I would say, aren't the best stewards of the hobby. Uh, not saying I am. Uh, I've made some mistakes of my own. Um, I try to own those as best I can. But, and, but, but you are a responsible drone owner. If you were to take your plane generally. and hit somebody's car and bust their window, you'd you wouldn't just go, oh, I'm out of here and run away. Yeah. You would probably say, hey, I'm really sorry. Let me help you fix that because that, that would, I just got away from me. Uh, please don't, you know, be upset. Mm -hmm. You know, I, um, yeah. And you've got, you've got, um, I, I know a, a, a lot of this is probably geared in response to the possibility of groups like, say, Amazon starting to do drone package deliveries and mm -hmm. drones becoming much more prevalent and the future functions that those can have. So, yeah, I'd rather that didn't have to be the case. Um, I think in the long run, once all this gets figured out, it's probably going to be okay. Like, it's going to be a little bit of an inconvenience to have to deal with, mm -hmm. but I don't see it being the worst thing in the world. Yeah. I think uh, the only thing... And I guess I didn't add this, so I'll mention it here. 
uh, a lot of people are can feel very upset that this is a stomping on basic rights, like basic rights in America. Mm -hmm. And I think the only thing in the Fifth Amendment, you have the right not to indemnify yourself, right? You don't have to give up information. If a cop comes and says, hey, uh, how, how high were you flying? Like, I don't know. And you don't have to do yeah. it. However, the FAA has that information and can request it, and you have no options. So the only thing is, is that flight log can be sequestered, as it were, or used. And you don't have a say in that. And that's probably the only thing, is it's a big stomp on that Fifth Amendment right for you to say, yeah. I didn't do it. <laughs> you know, like, prove it. <laughs> prove it, copper. You know, <laughs> you don't got nothing on me. Um, and the, the answer is, no, we do. You know, the FAA has every right to see what you've been doing, where you've been doing it. Matter of fact, they've got logs to show this, you know, and we can use that against you. Yeah. I, and I, and I guess they're, I guess the leg they're standing on there is that is not an outside mechanism observing. It is, you are required to have this device on board that is continuously reporting. Exactly. So you, like you say, you don't have the, you no longer have the option to say, I don't know how high I was. Right. I don't I know don't, how fast I was I, going. I don't have a recorder on this thing. I have no idea. Uh, yeah. it, look, the tree is this high. I was twice the tree height. It's, uh, it should be good. You know, mm -hmm. a little, do you know, you're two miles beyond the tree and it's actually, you know, like way <laughs> up there. You're like, Oh geez. But I mean, heck if you oh, were, Oh boy, I know. Right. Um, yeah, exactly. So I think that's the biggest stomp and, I, I'm not happy about that and, and that it's, it's a right that we're losing through this, but it's a very special case. And, and it, there's a lot of talk about how it's for safety and security. And the, the truth of the matter is all the things leading up to it. My personal opinion is I, I don't know how much safety and real security it's actually giving wrongdoers are going to wrongdo. Like it's just right. like, uh, if you think about, I used to work for airports and they put up these 10 foot fences with barbed wire and stuff. And everybody's like, it don't matter. Like if you want to get through the fence, you get through the dang fence. And you just, you cut it and you'll go and you won't care that there's a 10 foot barbed wire fence. It just keeps most normal idiots from doing dumb stuff. Like, ah, that's yeah. a pain in the butt and I could get hurt. Ah, forget it. Well, they shouldn't have been trying to do anything anyway. And obviously it wasn't much. Well, the flip much, side of that too is if, if you if so, if one is not going to comply, then there's not so much that, you know, do you know this? Do you, know, you just weren't complying. You mm -hmm. know, if, if you're actively not doing it, well, then that takes a whole subset of situations out of the way and just says you were, you were in the wrong and you were actively not complying. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does. You know, like, yeah, that gate's there. Yeah, that gate keeps me out. But if somebody's going to cut that gate and go in, well, all right, let, you know, you knew the gate was there. Therefore, here's the book. It's getting thrown at you. Mm -hmm. And much like the poor guy in Philadelphia, and I say poor guy, and that $182,000 just seems a big overreach as far as, you know, it's like, really, do you, does it have to be a big example? But, I mean, look, the FAA got what they needed in that it became visible. You know, for those who yeah, are watching did. and those who care, that is a big, you know, oh, geez, I better pay attention, huh? You know, mm -hmm. and, and basically, yeah, it's and it's it's like we were talking about last time that, you know, if you if you're in a high speed chase, <laughs> when you get caught, you know, should you get caught, yeah. you will be thrown every violation you had along the way. Everything, you know, turn signals, lack of turn signals while, while we're changing <laughs> lanes, 600 counts, you know, that kind of stuff. So, you know, it'll, it'll all be there. So, All right. Well, um, I think we're coming up on our longer limits than we like. Uh, so mm -hmm. briefly, to kind of end this out on a happier note, Matt, we're on a lighter note. Yeah. What, do you, uh, what do you plan on working on in the next little bit? Well, I'm going to test out this, uh, the foam board cutter, the time saver, and mm. I'll have that running and maybe we spend a little bit of time and talk about what that is, how it works. And then, 
you know, my impressions of what it, how it cuts. Like, is it scraggly? Is it a heck of a lot better than doing it by hand? Or is it not worth my time? Right. Like, right. So, uh, I'll have some of that. Um, if we end up, I have this, the master series Corsair by flight test. And if you start yours, I might, we might do, I might start mine and we build it together as it were. Uh, and talk about it on the podcast as we go, if you want to do that. Otherwise, you know, it's, I have some, some plane skins coming from the Hangar RC. Um, and when they come here, I plan on building those and I look forward to it. I'll probably repair the seven, which might be a hot mess to actually use after that. Cause it's, it's in rough shape. <laughs> Every time I look at it, I'm like, oh, I'll totally get to, that is pretty bad. <laughs> kind of like, mm, maybe a different day. <laughs> I move on to something else. Um, but it'll probably be one of those things. Um, and I'm also, I'm almost finished with the larger size uh, T37. So I'll probably use the foam board cutter to test the fitment and some of the information on that too. So okay. uh, I might have a plant set ready to test next time we talk. All right. What about you, Joe? Uh, let's see. I know that the, so we've got the build night coming up on the, I think we said the 15th. Yes. 15th. Double check the calendar. Yeah. So it's almost a uh, week the away. Current, yeah. The current plan is that Saturday I'm planning to drive up to your place and we'll mm-hmm. get to hang and hopefully fly a little bit. I probably won't have anything new built since then. Um, are you going to fix the old fogey wing and put the, uh, put put the was it the glider wing on it i think do i think maybe when i come up that day i will okay um yeah that'll be a simple weekend yeah this weekend my uh my worship leader i'm planning to take him out flying oh good and uh, i know how the fogey flies so i'd rather have it like that yeah um you know and then once i'm done with that flight and I'm up at your place, you know, we can play around with it, cut it off, see if there's a way to still be able to put the old fogey wing back on top, mm-hmm. even though it's going to be modded to have the, so I think we'll we figure that it. out. Um, yeah. And then alongside that, um, I've kind of talked to my dad a little bit and he's wanting to, he's interested in flying with me. Um, so I've got to, in very short order, uh, order in a transmitter uh that i can then buddy box with him when with and i've pretty much set my eyes on the radio master tx 16 s i think okay um, yeah which is the newer version or the uh i guess open source version of the jumper t16 um yes they kind of made a side project that was independent and could then be done they could do different things with it um they're mm-hmm. a little bit more free i guess um yeah, so the T-16, and, and we did a uh, check when I was up. We didn't even talk about it, but we checked on using um, y- using the two modules, the internal module as a receiver and the external module of the T-16 as a transmitter, allowing you to have um, wireless, wireless buddy, buddy box. box. And we, yeah, I, even I with swear the we were going to, yeah, I, I swear we were going to get that darn thing working. But we did confirm that with a wire even, you definitely can do a buddy box with that and it'll work well. So, so that's my intention is that I can, I'll order the second module to go with it so that hopefully I can get the, the wireless system going. Mm -hmm. Um, if not, the aux cable will be the, the fallback, but I'm really hoping I can get that, that wireless. Oh, me too. Uh, Actually, maybe even when you come up, we can even test the, the wireless system. We can test it again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, even, even if we can't, use even if it doesn't work with your transmitter or mine we can still use my son's transmitter you know the boy's transmitter and mine because they we set those up to be wireless but we've never actually tested it yet so that might be something we do this week so maybe that's what we do okay um we'll see sure yeah um um what else any anything else uh well i want to mention that our build night and discord is Next Friday, um, so the 15th, between 8 and 11 p.m., will be in our Discord channel. It'll be Build Party. 
Um, we'll have a link to the Discord in the bottom of this notes. So have at it, sign up, uh, welcome yourself to the Discord channel. You get a lot of people uh, welcoming you aboard, I'm sure. I know Joe and I are usually ones who are on that, but we're not the only ones. Um, and yeah, mm -hmm. and, you know, when you're there, like, yes, you may be there for the build night, but you know, stick around and listen in and, you know, we'll be posting nonsense that we do along the way. So I guess if you want the insider tip as to what Joe and I are going to do in the in-between times, you know, when the podcasts are unavailable, because next week isn't there yet, right? You can probably That's just right. pay attention to the, the Discord channel. Likely you'll see a sneak peek of what we'll, what we'll be talking about, at least in part of the episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there anything else? Uh, I think that probably just about covers it. Uh, as a reminder, we have alternate emails set up now, so you can write us individually. I'm going to harp on it one more time. Matthew at AviationRCNoob.com or Joe at AviationRCNoob.com. Uh, feel free to swing by our website, uh, AviationRCNoob.com. If you want to um, you know, see what we've got going on there, I know it's a little bare right now, but we're hopefully going to be working on it a little more uh, soon enough. But there is a contact us form there. If you don't want to send us an email, there's a form under contact us that you can fill out and let us know your thoughts or ask us questions, questions about this show, questions about previous episodes or anything you got. Also, uh, two episodes from now, we're going to be doing our sort of a year in review uh, episode, which will be focused on, say, the our last year a little over a year like i've been in the hobby um mm -hmm. you know kind of what we what we've done what we've learned in that process but also the the last year in the podcast so if you have any questions you know hobby or podcast related please write yeah. in uh ask us because we'd love to address those during that episode mm -hmm. um and if there's anything you want us to talk about in future episodes um, we've got some ideas of things that we've got planned out, but eventually, you know, we're going to run out of our ideas. We're going to want to, you know, Hey, what do you guys want us to talk about? Yeah, exactly. There's also a flight test forums, uh, show page or basically where we post, uh, the new podcast as they come out. Um, mm -hmm. when we do just, you know, if you're listening to that episode, reach out there, we check it, uh, and see what you're doing. I'm on flight test forums often, um, talking about whatever I'm kind of designing or building or thoughts or, you know, post on what I'm doing. So uh, that's another way to kind of see what we're up to. Um, so, yeah, come by and say hi and let us know what you think of the episodes. Even if you're kind of catching up, it's good. All right. With all that, we're going to go ahead and get out of here. Guys, thanks for tuning in and listening. We'll catch you all next time. All right. Catch you then.